Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second roundtable, Community Land Trust roundtable. My name is Natasha Holst, and I'm joined here today with three of the front runners from Community Land Trust movement in Europe. Um, these three European practitioners uh, tackling the problem of land access in their own unique way, depending on the culture or the legal and fiscal structures of the country where they're based. Uh, so today we'll be talking to Tom Chance of the National CLT Network, based in London, um, Callum McLeod from the National CLT, sorry, Callum McLeod from the Community Land Scotland and Geert de Pau from Community Land Trust Brussels. Uh, so my name is Natasha Holst and I work at the Schumacher Center for, I'm the program director for European Land Commons. And my role is to support the international and national collaboration for land commons. Um, I'm based in Amsterdam, um, just outside of Amsterdam. And together with a group of organizations, I recently founded uh, the Dutch Land Trust, Grond van Bestaan, and we're also working together with um, other organizations who are also working to create a community land trust in uh, on the south edge of Amsterdam uh, called Community Land Trust Belmer. Um, so I would like to uh, first, we're going to have a, a number of presentations today, um, talking about the different organizations, how far they are and yeah, what are they focusing on? And we will also be looking at how land access um, relates to a number of societal problems and how community ownership and land access could actually be um, a way to solve these issues and converging crisis around climate change, around affordable housing, and around the growing inequality. Um, so I will go first to Tom. Tom, welcome. Um, Thank you, good afternoon. Maybe you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit and uh, yeah, tell us a, bit, a little bit more about uh, your work in the UK. Sure, thank you, Natasha. Um, so I'm, as mentioned, the, the Chief Executive of the National Community Land Trust Network for England and Wales. And there's always the confusion in the, or the complication in the UK with our uh, complicated governance. So Callum will be speaking about Scotland. I'm speaking about England and Wales. And there's nobody this afternoon speaking about Northern Ireland, the different component parts of the UK. Um, we're a membership body for community land trusts across the two countries. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the community land trusts in our country are doing, what our organisation is doing, and our approach to our mission, which is to mainstream the community ownership of land and housing. So shall I, shall I dive into that now, Natasha? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. So there you go. Mainstreaming is our watchword, is what we're trying to do. We don't want to be an organisation that supports a nice little niche activity with the odd nice community doing interesting things. I mean, it's lovely and I love visiting them all, but um, we want this to change the way that we own land and change the way that we do housing in the UK, or particularly in England and Wales. Uh, what are community land trusts doing? So this is the classic If most people, if you ask them in England about community land trusts, they'd think of examples like this. This is small affordable housing schemes. These are all rural in the southwest of England, all actually delivered in partnership with mainstream social housing providers called housing associations, where the community owns the land, the community decides where the homes go, uh, what the affordability policy is, what bricks they use so they fit into their local context and so on, um, and with a variety of housing tenures. But CLTs do lots of other things as well. So there's a CLT in the east of England that is taking forward a 500 home garden village to triple the size of their village. So it's a major development, um, harking back to the roots of community land trusts in places like Letchworth Garden City and the Garden Cities movement the, in the early 20th century in the UK. CLTs are doing larger urban development. So this is a, an estate in central London that was a 600 home um, council estate where the council got into a 
protracted fight with the tenants in the 1980s trying to demolish their estate. Uh, it eventually got transferred into community hands in 1990 and but turned itself into a community land trust and is has just been completing a 23 million pound project to build new homes, some on top of their existing blocks, some around and some new, new uh, community facilities. So they can be very small rural community land trusts, they could be quite substantial urban organisations. Um, they do all sorts of other things as well. So many of the community land trusts, particularly in rural areas, they don't just own homes, they own their village shop, pub, post office, community centre. They are owning, they, they take on a variety of assets in their area in order to secure the sustainability of their community um, through that kind of community asset ownership and action. And this is a nice example. This is one where they did a little video um, last spring because this is in Somerset in Southwest England. They, they, own, they own affordable housing and a shop and a post office. And when the pandemic hit, they coordinated all of the relief and mutual aid and support for their village and the surrounding villages to make sure that people were able to get access to food, delivering parcels, helping the vulnerable and so on. So they become a linchpin of their community beyond just this sort of slightly abstract thing of owning assets. They have ambitions also that sometimes really surprise even me having worked with a lot of them. So thankfully the uh, issue of the climate emergency has, has been rising up the agenda and um, in the UK there's you know a lot of efforts, em emphasis now on how would we get to net zero, how would we reduce emissions to a net zero level and this is a community land trust in Cambridgeshire that has completed some affordable housing and was looking at the fact that everybody in their village was dependent on oil heating. And that meant it was both an issue around climate change because of the carbon emissions from their oil heating. And also it was a matter of fuel poverty because of the, it's actually very expensive to heat your home using oil. So they have been developing a pro project to take the entire village off of oil by installing a district heating system. So a heat network across the village powered by renewables and they're hoping to break ground on that this year. So they have planning permission. They have been doing a lot of exploratory work and they think that's a goer. So there's a real ambitious uh, project. The sorts of things that communities can do when they own their own, uh, in this case, own some land and they have the assets and the ability to take the lead in transforming their community and uh, addressing the climate emergency. And they do many other things as well. So here's a community land trust in Shropshire in the west of England that has um, this was from last year, completed the purchase of a, uh, a water meadow for conservation and is also looking to complete the purchase of a 94 acre hill farm. And their purpose is to buy up strategically land between two areas of conservation that are disconnected to join those two up and ensure that there's a much wider area of land in, the, in an area of outstanding natural beauty that is managed for conservation um, for, for wildlife and, for, and also for sort of responsible farming. And they have no interest in housing whatsoever, that group. They're just doing land for other purposes. So those are all the variety of things, but mostly, to be honest, community land trusts in England and Wales are focused on housing. So I'll just take you through these, these charts. This is a piece of research we commissioned last year from a company called Capital Economics as part of the evidence base for government around value for money. And we were looking at if government puts a pound into a community land trust, what public benefit does it create? And thankfully it showed, because we, we, we weren't sure about this, but it did show actually there's a very strong value for money, um, uh, government investing in it. And these are just a few things, a few extracts from that report that give you a sense of what CLTs are doing. So on the left, there's a pie chart. And this is interesting because often people have heard about community land trusts in the United States and they think, ah, oh, so community land trusts do affordable home ownership. Well, in England and Wales, the vast majority of homes being developed by community land trusts and then housing cooperatives and other forms of community-led or collaborative housing, the majority of them are delivering stuff for rent because that's what's most needed in the UK. Um, even though we have a pretty strong history of public provision of affordable rented housing through councils and housing associations, when communities look at the affordability needs in their village or in their town or their city, what most people need is what we in the UK call social rent or affordable rent. And there is a little wedge in the top left there of some low cost home ownership and some CLTs have pioneered models that look similar to stuff happening in the US or that we'll hear about from here to Brussels. The other interesting thing is just where's the land coming from? So these two charts on the right give you an inkling. Um, the first shows you 
that almost 40% of projects get their land for free or for a token price where you know you pay a pound, something like that. Um, only around 18% are paying a full market price for the land for their development. So at the moment, community land trusts are very not quite dependent on that, but certainly benefiting from very low cost land, which means they can focus instead on public benefit rather than sinking all their money into paying upfront for the land. And the split of the source of land you'll see in the bottom chart in urban areas, the main source of land for community land trusts is local government um, and a small number coming from private individuals or other sources. And in rural areas, it's the other way around, so private individuals. And we're talking here about normally landowners who have a long-standing connection to the area. Maybe they're a farmer, they would like to, they're happy to sell off a bit of their land in order to provide some affordable housing for the village at a low cost because they want to see the village thrive and it's in their own interests as well as their kind of ethos that this is a genuinely sustainable community. And so they, they are in support of the community land trust doing that. So that's what CLTs are. About us, we are with a national membership body, as I mentioned, across England and Wales. And we were set up about 10 years ago by a dozen or so pioneering CLTs who, in a way, the ethos was that it was much too hard for them to do it. How can we change the way that the land market works, the housing market works in England and Wales so this is easier and this can become mainstreamed? Well, over 10 years, we've now got about 412 community land trusts across the country. Of those, around 260 are actually incorporated and doing things, and others are sort of forming and trying to develop projects. And our focus as the national body is not to go and hold all of their hands through actually delivering projects, but really to focus on national local policy and the market development side of things to try to transform the way that the system works so this becomes easier. In our business plan, we have this baffling looking graphic. It's called a theory of change. And if you want, you can find this in our whole business plan on our website. But this, what, along the top, there are some chevrons. And the thought process is, how do you get from somebody who might want to do a community land trust to the point where anyone can do this? And what are the barriers that get in their way? What would need to happen? And what do we then do to address those? And so all of our work is looking strategically at what would be the most impactful thing we could do to unlock this across the country. Um, and so we do advocacy work, we do a little bit of awareness raising, we've been developing a support infrastructure and developing the market. And there's a sort of underlying thing there about developing us as a sustainable organization. And we also try to be, and we're increasingly doing this, be collaborative in saying, well, we, we're not the only people in the world trying to do this kind of stuff in the UK. How can we work with others who, are also, who have similar objectives and look for the gaps? So we don't, you know, if somebody else is doing it well, we don't need to do it. So our main thing, the thing we're best known for is national advocacy. And this is a picture from a few years ago of a housing minister speaking at our conference. Um, we have had significant traction and brought tens of millions of pounds and changed government policy at national level and regional level to support community land trusts. And they're now pretty widely recognized. So just about any government paper that comes out on a relevant topic, it will refer to community land trusts. The policy community in well, London, let's face it, the policy community in London will routinely look at this so there was a report the other week on climate change and community ownership and included profiles of community land trusts and talking about CLTs being part of addressing the climate emergency. The other thing we've really done is is develop this enabling infrastructure so um, you know England and Wales isn't a big country compared to say the United States but it's still big enough that me working in London or one of my colleagues working in Leeds we don't understand and we don't have a good grasp on all the things that you need to know to support a CLT in every part of the country. And it's about what's the land market like? What's the housing market like? Who works in the council? What are the, what are the property developers, the housing associations, the other market actors in the area? And we have found over the years that local support organizations are better able to support communities through projects than we can nationally. So rather than try to empire build to make ourselves the, the place that, you know, that people go to, we have supported partners around the country to develop this patchwork work of support organizations that themselves are developing as social enterprises where their business model is they get income through helping projects succeed. And we've worked with partners in the cooperative housing and the co-housing community world to try to develop this and to make it also be able to support all those other sorts of collaborative housing approaches. And this has been highly successful. So if, if, if I were to go back to the map of all of our members, the highest concentration of completed projects is where you have these sorts of organizations rather than communities 
being bounced from one consultant to the next and one funding scheme to the next. The third leg along with advocacy and the support network is market development. So this is a quote from the chief executive of an organization called ASTA, which is a social housing provider, mainly in the southwest of England with about 20,000 homes. And they have partnered with a number of community land trusts to develop projects. And what's great is that for the community, it means they get all that development expertise, you know, expecting a community to become property developers and stewards and managers and all these things. Not, not every community wants to do all of that. And they've been able to, we've been able to develop these partnerships with like-minded organizations that see that this is all about empowering people in developing strong communities and then can develop partnership models with the CLT where the principle that the community owns the land and is in control is retained but then the community is bringing people to the table who can help them to deliver their aspirations. So rather than trying to empower every community to do everything themselves, we're trying to bring other bits of the market to the table to be able to work with CLTs. The, these are probably, I think, the, in a way, the, the five biggest challenges we have. If we really want to mainstream this, we don't just want this to be 400, say, CLTs with a few thousand homes. The first is just to classic one that we're a small and underfunded team. We, our members are income poor, so we get a bit of income from our members, but we rely at the moment on grant funding from a few sources of uh, uh, grant funders. And for us, it's a challenge as to how we try to grow and develop what we're doing, given the sheer scale of the opportunity, but the lack of resource that we have. And I'm sure that's familiar to anyone who works in these kinds of fields. The second challenge is that housing, even though it's recognized as being a major policy priority in the UK, somehow doesn't have that traction in government. So we've had 10 housing ministers in 11 years. And as soon as we've got a housing minister on board with understanding community land trust, they're reshuffled out and a new one comes in. So our advocacy work has been very challenging because we're constantly having to restate the case and constantly having to find the, you know, the latest faction that is in, con in control of, in our case, the Conservative Party and get them on board with it. But actually the Conservatives on a whole have been pretty supportive of CLTs um, in the UK. The third is this I think the most profound one, which is there is a deep culture of paternalism in the UK and people look to either the private sector or government to solve these problems. And people in the government and the private sector are very skeptical about community and community ownership, community power, community capability, and tend to think that if you try to get the community involved, it's going to be slow, expensive, it's not going to go anywhere. So a lot of our work is demonstrating the credibility and how you know what communities can achieve and pointing to international examples as well as the growing evidence base in the UK of, of what communities can do. The fourth is that in comparison to Scotland, and you know, we hear from Callum about what's happening in Scotland, land reform just isn't on the political agenda in England, in Wales, or in the UK as a whole. Uh, there have been people who tried to do that, and of course George Monbiot, who gave the opening you know, the, lecture, the annual um, lecture this year for the Schumacher Institute, has been part of trying to get that on the agenda, but it just isn't. And so we promote community land trusts not as a land reform issue, but as a way of addressing things like housing, like conservation, much more tangible. It's about the outcome that community land trusts can achieve, rather than thinking there's something about communities owning land themselves that's important. The final challenge is one that I know that our friends in the US have discussed a lot in recent years, keeping community at the heart of CLTs. The more mainstream these become, the more the danger is the community is lost. And so the, you know, the 500 home garden village or local authorities looking at, in some parts of the country, CLTs being a default model by which they're delivering regeneration in their area. The danger is that you end up with a fig leaf of community that there's technically a legal body that meets the legal definition of a CLT and allows people to join it and for communities to be involved. But actually, the community isn't really involved and it's not building ownership among the wider community. It's not building engagement and empowerment and making and giving people a sense of how they can be using the land as their common good to be you know, supporting their well-being. So that's me for now and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Tom. That was really interesting. I, I was wondering also, <clears throat> maybe you could also just quickly mention, how did you uh, start working on CLTs? Um, what was your personal? Uh... Yeah, 
Sure. Um, it was when I was working as the researcher on the head office for two Green Party politicians in London City Hall. And in London, there was both it, 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 huge affordability problems, but also many communities feeling trampled over. And we were looking for alternative approaches where communities could be part of the solution rather than just being pushed to one side by government and private sector. And I came across Community Land Trust in Cornwall, thought it was really inspiring, and we were thinking about what we could do with that. And then came across London CLT, um, and so helped London CLT get their first site in East London. So was, uh, over the years, of, I worked for about 10 years in, um, at City Hall and supported and promoted CLTs from there and then ended up coming to work. Well, I worked freelance a bit and ended up working at the National CLT Network. But I think a lot of people are coming to it a similar way. They kind of, you know, there's a, there's a particular problem as a policymaker or a practitioner, they're seeing a problem and they still think, actually, there's something about the CLT model that's quite exciting. And that's, and then, and then, coming to work with us one way or another. And what do you think that, that thing is that's so exciting? The, uh, what what uh, attracts people to it? I think it's partly or just- you personally? A, yeah, <laughs> I think there's partly, there's just a really nice energy about it. There's something, you know, when you meet, when you, when you, if you if, well, when we have physical events, we can get people together in a room. When you hear from what communities are doing around the country, and we always have to try to have an emphasis on what they've actually done, not just, a theory it's just really inspiring to hear what people can achieve and you start to see all sorts of ways in which the the, the way that our industry works could change so there's a report the a couple of weeks ago by the archbishop of canterbury who's the, the head of the church of england about what the church should be doing about housing and he had this quote where he said basically that if we want to be building homes and communities not just bricks and mortar the whole nature of the industry should be changed and I think lots of people have this sense that the whole nature of the industry needs to be changed, but they don't really know how. And then somehow CLTs come along and you think, oh, that's how. And we've done, we're kind of doing that with housing. And it's interesting thinking about other, other areas like the, cons the conservation and farming and so on. You know, can we kind of have a similar revelation there? So post-Brexit, people in the UK are thinking about what's the farming subsidy regime? And there's the idea of moving more towards rewarding public goods rather than output. Or, you know, things like that. And you think, well, if you've got a kind of public good regime, then there's something about communities owning land and stewarding it for the, the long-term well-being that aligns with that and is interesting. And maybe it's something about how we have a future farming policy. You know, there's, there's these things start, I think people start to make those connections, but the challenge for us, we've got to kind of scale it enough that they feel it's worth engaging with and then they get excited about it. Thanks. Well, that it's, it's really quite amazing to hear how, how quickly uh, CLTs have grown in the UK and also quite inspiring. But the same thing, of course, uh, goes for Scotland and uh, I think even more successful than, than even in the UK at the moment. Uh, if you, you know, we don't have to compare, but I think it's a totally different situation. And uh, Callum could maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, Callum, for, uh, Thank you for your presentation. Much. Thank you very much, Natasha, um, and, and, and thanks to the Institute as well for the invitation to participate in this, this roundtable. It's, uh, it's great to, to hear from, from colleagues in terms of um, their experiences uh, with regard to the, the, the Community Land Trust movement. Um, Tom's already mentioned that the, the situation in Scotland is slightly different from other parts of the UK, um, and I think that's true. Uh, in relation to community ownership and the community land trust movement here in Scotland. Um, I, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll share my screen with you. I'm going to talk a little bit about obviously Community Land Scotland um, as a, an organisation and what we do, but I want to really uh, actually try and set that within the broader context of land reform in Scotland and where community ownership sits within uh, that broader agenda. And, I would define land reform as certainly in, in terms of the Scottish context. It's about changes to the ownership or use of land in the public interest. Uh, and that the public interest is a really important concept in all of this because it helps to frame a lot of the kind of policy um, evolution in Scotland with regard to what's been happening over the last uh, 30 years, certainly uh, within the, the contemporary context, but it actually goes back a lot further than that as well. Um, so I'll, I'll share my screen with you and then uh, talk you through uh, some of the kind of the, the main themes, if you like, that I'm sure we're going to come back to in the discussion as well.
Okay, um, I, I'm talking to you from Glasgow where I live, um, but I'm actually from uh, the area that's in the photograph here, uh, which is of the, um, it, it's taken from the Isle of Harris in the Outer Hebrides, the Western Isles of Scotland, the far northwest of Scotland, overlooking uh, the, a stretch of water to the Isle of Skye, which is part of the Inner Hebrides there. Um, the photographs there for two reasons. One, just to remind me of where I've come from. That's always quite a good thing to do, I think. Uh, but more specifically as well, to really flag up an important couple of points with regard to um, the, the, the broader context for community ownership and land reform in Scotland. And that is twofold. One point being that the land question in Scotland has a very long history. Um, and that history to simplify uh, probably far too much, can stretch back to uh, the 18th and 19th centuries in, in, in the highlands of Scotland and particularly around uh, a set of issues which are, are, are termed the highland clearances. Now what that in effect involved was um, a kind of social engineering to a degree whereby the landlords of large estates in Scotland in the highlands of Scotland uh, decided ultimately to encourage and um, in, in many cases forcibly remove uh, their tenantry from the estates that they actually owned and they did that in the 18th and 19th centuries because uh, at a time of uh, when are we not in a time of economic turmoil and kind of uh, globalized capital and so on uh, they realized that sheep and deer were a more profitable commodity uh, than having a uh, low uh, rent paying tenants on their land and so the highland clearances are a really important dimension of the historical context for land reform generally and the land question in Scotland uh, and also the uh, evolution of um, the community land ownership movement itself. The second important general kind of point to note as well and it's very much related to that historical context is that in Scotland we have uh, an almost probably uniquely concentrated pattern of land ownership, rural land ownership. 83% of Scotland's rural land is in private ownership. Approximately 50% of that uh, privately owned rural land is in the hands of about 400 owners. Uh, that's about 0.008% of the population. So it's, as I say, a uniquely concentrated pattern of large scale rural land ownership. Now that causes a structural issue because uh, with, uh, on, on a structural level, that sort of monopoly, large scale concentrated ownership can lead to negative impacts in terms of how land is used and to what ends in relation to the public interest. And I agree, well, I, I kind of agree with Tom in the sense that, that community ownership but community ownership in and of itself is a useful thing and a valuable thing to have. But I certainly agree with him that community ownership that's being uh, taken forward by land trusts in Scotland is with a view to meeting different ends which are going to benefit communities and also, also deliver wider public goods. So that's a really important kind of element to, to bear in mind in relation to all of that. And we contend in relation to um, the land reform movement and the community ownership uh, movement in Scotland that there is a very clear relationship between land ownership and land use in terms of control and power. Now, land reform's detractors in Scotland, and believe me, they do exist, uh, will argue that the two are separate issues, but they're not, because frankly, uh, to a large extent, if you own land, uh, you are able to kind of shape some of the, the um, what happens on it in practice. I'll come back to that in, in a few moments. Let me say a few words in, about Community Land Scotland as an organisation. Uh, like Tom's, we're a relatively small organisation, we're a national membership body for, uh, surprise, surprise, community landowners, both urban and rural in Scotland. Uh, we were set up in um, 2010, so we've just uh, celebrated our 10th anniversary. Um, and the reason we were set up actually was because um, there was a real feeling amongst proponents of land reform and having more community ownership that the political momentum around community ownership and land reform had began to dissipate by 2010. I'm going to come on and discuss briefly some of the initiatives and po policy initiatives that kind of pushed community ownership and the land reform agenda uh, forward over the last 25 years. But there was certainly a feeling that by 2010, 
that had dissipated and drained away, that momentum had gone. So we were formed as an organization. We had 17 uh, member community land trusts at that point. That, that number has now grown to 106, mostly owning land or other assets. Some are aspiring landowners as well. Uh, it's an, import, an important point to note here is that, um, that own, uh, housing is, is clearly a very important dimension of what community land trusts in Scotland do. It's a very, very uh, significant focal point for, from their perspective, but it's not the only thing that they do by any manner of means. There's quite a wide, a very wide, in fact, diverse range of types of development activities that community land trusts undertake in Scotland, both rurally and within the urban context as well. In terms of our functions, well, broadly, they're kind of the same as what uh, those, those that uh, Tom mentioned for, the, the, um, for, for his organisation. So we have a, uh, a particular advocacy policy role for our members. So we are very active in terms of uh, the devolved um, parliamentary system and, and government system here in Scotland, which uh, is, is directly connected to the re-establishment of a Scottish Parliament in 1999, and that's led to the devolution of a whole range of different policy areas and competences uh, to the, 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 the level of, of Scotland uh, as a nation, which has been very significant. We have uh, a kind of support mechanism as well in terms of uh, providing peer support, knowledge exchange and other elements to our, our members too. And we also have a fundamentally a, a, a kind of under uh, scoring element, which is the idea of promoting a socially just Scotland. And we contend very clearly that land reform and community ownership are two elements actually helping to contribute to achieve these more socially just, uh, sustainable uh, objectives for Scotland that serve the public interest and the common good in that regard. Let me just say a few words as well about the way in which um, the the growth in community assets has developed over the, the, the last number of years. Although land reform is a very old issue and historical issue in terms of, of, of Scotland's um, evolution, its evolution in Scotland, the contemporary community land movement is relatively recent in terms of its um, evolution and development. So really the, the, the first uh, landmark, as it were, community land buyouts happened in the early 1990s. So there was one in the, the, the Highlands of Scotland by the Ascent Crofters Trust that got a lot of media, international media attention at the time. Um, and, and so the level of assets has grown from these quite high profile um, buyouts in, in the 1990s through the 2000s and so on. And you'll see that's happened in terms of uh, the growth of, of um, land and other assets from, from 44 in 1990 through to 500 odd in, in 2018. These are Scottish government figures. Some of the elements that have been important in relation to that have been funding, legislation, and other dimensions too. And I just want to mention a few things about them uh, also. Um, so some of the key drivers for community ownership are, are very much uh, to the fore here. You can see them in, in this particular slide. There's funding available to support the buy, the, the purchase of um, land and other assets. In Scotland, we're not frankly as fortunate uh, as perhaps is the case for, for some of Tom's members in, in terms of the uh, price that we have to pay for the land that we need to develop and sustain our communities and, and build and, and do all the good things that we want to do. Um, the land fund is a really important uh, source of funding for enabling communities to buy land uh, and other assets, 10 million pound uh, budget annually to do that. There are various community rights to buy set in successive land reform acts since devolution that have been very important as well. So there are four of these community rights to buy. One of them um, is the original, which is a, uh, the community right to buy if there's a willing seller and communities meet certain criteria, they have basically first option on the land if it comes onto the market and the, and the seller is willing to do that. There are three other community rights to buy that do not require a willing seller. One is uh, the community right, the crofting community right to buy land, and that's focused specifically on the crofting counties of, of the Highlands of Scotland. And crofting is a, a form of uh, small landholding tenure uh, that relates directly back to the Highland clearances to enable people to stay in, in the land that they, they want to keep. 
but there's also a, a community right to buy abandoned or neglected land or that's detrimental to environment uh, to the environmental well-being of communities and also a very recently introduced right to buy to further sustainable development none of these three rights require a willing seller but they do have a very high public interest bar to to uh, to meet in order to to work in practice there's a great deal of support from institutions, from Scottish government. Um, land reform in Scotland is very much a public policy issue. It's uh, clearly um, hardwired into uh, government and parliament in terms of uh, public policy initiatives and the legislation and other initiatives are, are reflective of that. Um, it is also tied into a community asset transfer scheme for public authorities to transfer land into to community ownership as well. And that's tied into the Scottish Government's national performance framework too. The governing element of all this is around community empowerment and sustainable development through land and built asset ownership. And so that's the means to the end. Ownership as the way that you actually deliver the different types of benefits, community and more broadly in terms of public benefits, uh, to enable um, sustainability within communities in Scotland as a whole. Three examples very briefly in terms of um, the types of things that our, our organisations, our members are involved in. The uh, photograph on the, my left is of the West Harris Trust, again in the Outer Hebrides where I'm from originally. Uh, this is a, a community that took over uh, from the state, Crofting Estates, that um, in 2010 their community had a, a falling population, the demography of it was going in all the wrong directions, aging population, very few uh, school aged children, not much development going on at all in terms of the area. They've transformed that now in terms of the population, it's going up, the demography of it is much more balanced. They've got uh, renewable energy uh, initiatives going on, business initiatives, uh, a, a, a community centre which is, is a multi-purpose hub and so on. It's really kick-started that community in terms of uh, what it's doing and how it's actually taking control of its own destiny. The middle example here is a Briachan Forest Trust, uh, which um, is on the banks of Loch Ness in the Highlands. Uh, that is a community that owns a woodland and it's doing a number of things in terms of restoration there and, and woodland management. It's also doing some really pioneering work with regard to environmental education through its uh, forest school. And this is the forest classroom there. So we're not just talking about housing, important though it is in Scotland, we're also talking about other softer dimensions and how you can use ownership of an asset to actually meet a whole bunch of different um, objectives that are beneficial for the community and more broadly for society. The final example on the right hand of the screen is Bridge End Farmhouse. This is a rural community trust, uh, which is based in Edinburgh. Uh, the capital of Scotland uh, and this is uh, a community that is using its land right in the heart of, of Edinburgh in order to actually do a lot of kind of social good through the allotments that it has so it does skills and other types of training for individuals in the community it's in quite a socially and economically deprived area of, of Edinburgh so there's a whole bunch of issues going on there in terms of helping communities to develop what they want to do in practice there and, and developing and, and delivering public goods in relation to that for conference building, skills, training, and linking to uh, aspects of, of climate change through food production and consumption as well at the, at the local level. Just briefly uh, to, to kind of move things on, um, just some examples of the areas that we're working in at the, at the kind of policy and development level for Community Land Scotland as well. Uh, Tom mentioned COVID and some of the issues there around and the experience of community land trusts in, in, in England. Um, we've had a similar experience. We produced a report uh, a few months ago called Built in Resilience, Community Landowners' Responses to the COVID-19 Crisis. And what it was, um, a great many of our community trusts were actually almost first responders with regard to dealing with the crisis at the local level. Why were they that, doing that? Because they were the anchor organisations embedded within their communities. They were flexible, they were agile, and they were able to deliver medicines. They were able to kind of make sure people had food. They were able to provide support as well in a number of different ways. So in that way, community owners and community ethos in terms of resilience and, and capacity is very, very important in terms of, of that development. We've also, of course, been doing work in terms of, of housing as well, a big issue for all of our members. Um, uh, many of the members rather, uh, for reasons we've already rehearsed. Um, this is slightly off, off the beaten 
recently published a report called Plantation Slavery and Land Ownership in the West Highlands and Islands, Legacies and Lessons. Now you might say, what on earth does plantation slavery have to do with the modern context for land ownership in Scotland or indeed anywhere else? Well, in 1833, the British government to compensate uh, the owners of slaves uh, for the loss of their property, i.e. these slaves, uh, these people, who had the fortunate position of being slaves in, in, in plantations, uh, produced a 16, in today's terms, a 16 billion pound compensation fund in order to compensate for that loss of property. I use the term very advisedly. Um, why is that important for ownership and land reform? Because a huge, a, a significant number of these compensated individuals uh, spent or invested that money in uh, buying up estates in the Highlands and Islands in the 18. 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s uh, and a great deal of that money was then used to buy these estates and consolidate the structural monopoly yeah, that, we, that we have in, in relation to that. So that's a significant um, aspect in terms of, of those dimensions. We're going to be publishing a, a report um, next week on the relationship between community land ownership and the climate emergency. There are lots of issues to kind of tie into that as well that are, are very significant. I'm just going to very briefly finish by, by tying up these different dimensions together uh, and, and why they all connect, I think. Uh, Community Land Scotland has published a manifesto for our net for the Scottish Parliament election, which will be taking place in May of this year. And we have uh, a number of proposals which are tied around five interlinked themes. And these are, these are specific to Scotland in terms of the, the electoral context, but I would argue that probably of universal importance in terms of different uh, contexts. So we're looking to control land monopolies to protect the public interest. We're looking to empower com local communities to build local resilience in different ways and having and community land ownership is a, a significant part to play in that. Uh, community ownership as well has a big part in tackling the climate emergency in ways which are going to secure a just transition to a net zero uh, carbon economy in the UK and in Scotland in particular. Uh, we also have a demographic crisis in our rural areas in Scotland, so we need to think about how we repopulate them while still balancing uh, issues around environmental and economic and cultural sustainability. And we also need to think about ways in which to develop a fiscal framework to uh, ensure that we have a fair and sustainable uh, Scotland in future. These are specific issues that we are working on here in Scotland, but they, I suspect, have a universal uh, theme which runs through them as well. So thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you very much, Callum. Um, that's really impressive to see what's been going on in Scotland. And like you said, I think a lot of the issues are uh, very salient to a lot of different countries. Um, I think we'll be going into that discussion a little bit later. Uh, maybe just a quick question um, also from the Q&A. Um, we were wondering also, where, how did the land fund come about? And uh, is it uh, loans or is it? Uh... Well, it's, 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 um, it's a government fund, which is, yeah. uh, so it comes from Scottish government. And it's a £10 million uh, grant fund, not loans, it is, it is exclusively a grant fund. Um, so it was set up initially in 2001 uh, and it had an initial um, level of funding, I think it was £3 million per year, uh, and that was increased to £10 million uh, in I think 2007, the late 2000s anyway, sorry. Um, and it's a really important fund in terms of providing some, not or up to 95% of uh, capital costs for purchase. It also helped to support some revenue costs as well. There's a million pound threshold on it. So anything that's over a million pounds uh, has to go to Scottish ministers and government for uh, them to make a decision as to whether uh, that should be um, approved, if you like, um, which is a significant fund, but frankly, that such as the growth in terms of, of interest in community ownership, both rural and also since 2015 urban so a lot of the legislation and, and, and the the reach of, of um, 
community ownership and land reform legislation is, is now urban as well as rural. So, so that means it's a, it's a limited resource that's having to go much, much further in terms of what it's, it's looking to achieve. So there's a real debate now and, and needs to be in Scotland, to, first of all, to retain that fund. Uh, and we've called for it to be doubled uh, to 20 million pounds a year, given what, what, what the investment value is with regard to it. But also to think about other forms of funding as well in terms of how you support uh, more community ownership as well that goes beyond the very valuable and vital work of the, the land fund itself. So I imagine the community has to be organised before they are able to receive. It, it does. Yeah. It does. They, do, they do have to, to be, to be organised indeed. And um, so they have to meet particular criteria basically in terms of their governance structure. Uh, yeah. They have to have very clear business plans as well in terms of, of what they want to achieve with the land. Which comes back to Tom's earlier point about what the means to an end, as it were. What is it if you want to buy this asset? What do you want to achieve with it? Uh, and there also has to be community support as well. So it's not just, you know, a, a small number of people within a community that are, are looking to to drive something forward. It, it needs to have that that broader support. And that's one of the big values as well of community ownership as an approach. It's it's uh, accountable, it's transparent, and it's it's democratic in a way that other types of ownership perhaps aren't. Thanks, Callum. Uh, we'll just quickly move on to our final speaker, but uh, later we'll have more time to, for the discussion and also to answer some of the questions. Not all because we have 125 people uh, who have joined us, but we will be able to answer some of the questions. Um, Geert, Geert de Pau is also with us and he will be presenting his experience with the Brussels CLP. Geert, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself and tell us some more about uh, your experiences in Brussels. Thanks, Thank Natasha, and thanks for the invitation. I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, Geert de Pau, and I'm a coordinator of Community Land Trust uh, Brussels. Um, I'd like to start with a, a few words about the housing situation in, in Brussels. Brussels is the, the capital of Belgium and the capital of Europe. Um, and um, it is uh, one of the most diverse cities of, uh, in the world. Uh, more than 60% of the residents are uh, born uh, outside of Belgium. Uh, and these, these include both uh, wealthy expats who, who work in uh, institutions such as the European Union uh, and poor uh, workers who live in the in the poor uh, canal zone in, in Brussels. Uh, this also makes Brussels a very dual city, although a lot of wealth is produced. 39% of the inhabitants live below the poverty risk line. And while most of the neighboring countries uh, of Belgium have always invested in social rental housing, Belgium is a country where housing po policies have traditionally encouraged home ownership. And until the, the turn of the century, the, this was a fairly successful strategy. Private rental and purchase prices in Brussels were modest compared to other European cities. But this changed uh, from the year 2000 onwards. Prices started to rise uh, systematically and they have uh, continued to rise ever since. Uh, the poorest families were the victims, uh, the first victims of this uh, evolution. Together with the housing prices, the waiting lists for social housing exploded and poor families had to rely on the private rental market where they were forced to pay more and more for less and less quality or they had to leave uh, the, the capital. It was in this uh, context that Community Land Trust Brussels was founded. Activists for the right to housing and community organizations uh, didn't want to accept to wait for ages for new social housing to be built and started looking for alternative solutions. Uh, one of the um, uh, projects that preceded the community land trust uh, was this, uh, this project called L'Espoir, um, a community-led housing project where uh, we built 14 uh, homes uh, for low-income families in the municipality of Molenbeek. These families were closely involved in the development of the project. 
And we wanted, uh, after uh, it was finished uh, successfully, we wanted to repeat this, this project, but we were looking for a more a sustainable model of tenure because in this case, um, well, the housing were made, of, the houses were made affordable for the first uh, families, uh, but um, whenever one of these families will uh, sell its home, it can sell it at market rate. And we were looking for a way of making uh, houses affordable forever while giving uh, the residents the, the possibility to buy the home and, and build wealth. And we were also looking for a community-led model because this was also typical for this project, the involvement of the, of the future residents in the development of the project. And it was then in the United States that we discovered uh, the CLT model uh, that until then was, was really unknown here in Belgium and in the rest of uh, continental Europe. In September 2009, we had to visit the Champlain Housing Trust, uh, thanks to a, a grant of the Building and Social Housing Foundation. Uh, with four of us, we went to, we went to Burlington study how it was done uh, there. And uh, we came back uh, uh, very enthusiastic, enthusiastic and we wanted to, uh, to start something similar in, in Brussels. We started writing scenarios for the creation of a CLT and started also looking for subsidies. And in 2011, the Brussels Capital Region commissioned a feasibility study on the possibility of creating a CLT. And the rec recommendations of this study were put into practice in 2013 with the creation of Community Land Trust Brussels or CLTB. And at that, uh, that time we received also the first subsidies uh, to buy uh, two parts of land in, in Brussels. Today, almost 10 years later, our first three projects ha have been occupied, uh, totally, totaling 50 homes. Another 50 homes will be delivered in the coming months and another 100 are in the planning stage. We can count on the financial support of the Brussels region for our operation as part of its social housing policy. They give us the means to buy land and also uh, cover part of our operation, operating costs. Um, and until now, this support has been uh, has to be had to be renewed uh, year after year, but uh, probably in the coming months there will be a, a new legal framework, which which will uh, structural structural re <laughs> embed our operation in the Brussels housing policy. Thanks to the government support, we are able to sell housing to low income families. Our selling prices are 25 to 50 percent lower than the market value of the houses. And our target audience are, are families who are entitled to social housing. Uh, so the Brussels residents with the lowest income. There are often people with a migrant background uh, with the most diverse origins. Anyone who wants to buy a CLT home has to become a member of our organization. And the homes are then allocated uh, to, the, to the members with the longest seniority. Our, um, our operation and our projects are community led. The, the homes are allocated, are allocated before they are built. From the time of allocation, about two years before the homes are completed, we involve the future residents in the project. Uh, they help, um, they are involved in the, in the design process and also involved in, the, in, in thinking about how the project will be managed uh, once uh, the homes are occupied. Uh, together with our partner organizations, we organize a series of uh, trainings also to help future residents uh, to, uh, to, to, to give them the tools to be able to manage the, their homes uh, once they, they, they live in their homes. We also support the residents and the future reg residents to engage in community activity activities that allow for a proper integration of our projects in the neighborhoods where we are active. Uh, here, for instance, you can see Fatima, who is one of the key figures of a monthly flea market 
in the street where one of our projects would uh, be built later. This, this uh, woman of the Green Canteen Initiative um, make uh, every month Euro African dishes uh, in, on a guest table and they dream of making uh, this their profession one day. Well, this is Dorothe, who, is, uh, uh, who received uh, her first bicycle lessons from other volunteers of our organization and who is now one of the driving forces of uh, uh, continuing uh, this kind of, uh, of, of uh, lessons for other members. And we also uh, want to integrate uh, in our projects, we are thinking about integrating uh, uh, new mobili mobility solutions such as uh, uh, a stock of shared bikes for the neighborhood within our housing projects. Um, where possible, we, we will also integrate community facilities into our housing projects. And um, I'd like to take you on a, a, a short uh, virtual tour along our projects in Brussels. This one is our biggest project called uh, Arc-en-Ciel in, in Molenbeek. Uh, 32 homes and on the on the ground floor there is um, a neighborhood center a, a women women's center in fact uh, uh, where women from the neighborhood can come and uh, participate in all kind of activities with a, a common garden in the center this is another project uh, called uh, le nid uh, with six, seven homes and uh, also community facilities on the ground floor and uh, a shared garden that can be used also by other neighbors. This one is uh, called uh, Etoile du Nord. Uh, it, is, uh, it has to be built so next year. The, the, we will start uh, building it. Um, and here there are, uh, there are uh, some 15 homes and also facilities for, uh, for the neighborhood in the garden. And this one uh, is uh, one of our most ambitious projects called uh, Calico. Um, it will be delivered also in the coming months before this summer. Um, and it's an intergenerational housing project with uh, 32 homes. Uh, and in this project will also be included um, a home for bird and death, where women can come to give birth in a family environment, um, and where also uh, people can come to spend their last days in uh, specific fac facilities. And this is uh, this project is uh, well. The first residents will uh, occupy it in the coming next week. In fact, uh, it's also some uh, twenty-two homes. Uh, with a community kitchen uh, integrated in it. And then finally, uh, I would also would like to say a few words about, uh, about what's happening in, in Europe, outside, in Belgium and in Europe. Um, we, as, as Community Land Trust Brussels, um, we have always been able to count on the, on the support and the advice of uh, the community land trust uh, movement in the United States we, and, and, in, and in England. We had uh, experts coming over regularly to help us and uh, advise us and also talk to, uh, to um, politicians to, uh, to convince them that this model was not just some, uh, some crazy dream, but that it was possible and that there are uh, examples um, and this was really, really uh, very important for us uh, um, and, and key to our, to our success. And so it was uh, logical that we would also uh, take up a, a similar role um, because very soon we started to see that uh, our initiative got a lot of attention from other, um, other cities in Europe. And so the first year in an informal way, but then uh, since 2017, uh, with in, in integrated in a European funded project, um, we started to uh, organize a, a, a network of CLTs in Europe. Um, this project is called uh, Chic, and when we started, well, there were um, there were uh, in in Europe, uh, Brussels, the, the CLT of Ghent, Brussels, and and Lille. 
uh, and then of course a uh, um, lot more CLTs in, in England, but uh, that was all. And then here you see uh, um, how many uh, CLTs were, there were uh, well, almost two years ago. Today there are, uh, there are new ones uh, already. Um, a lot of community land trusts in France, but also in, in Berlin, in Amsterdam, in, in Dublin, people are uh, starting to, uh, well, are working to create uh, community land trusts. And in Belgium, for instance, also cities like, like Leuven are um, in the process of creating their own uh, CLTs. Thank you. Thank you, Geert. Um, yeah, that's it's it's a totally different story, but it's it's it kind of fits uh, together with everything else, and it also reminds me a lot of the of the U.S. situation. Um, in the U.S., also a question from the Q and A. Um, a lot of the yeah, a lot of the um, community land trust conservation is is around the. Um, is centered around dismantling colonial concepts of private land and ownership. And also um, a lot is about, yeah, reading from the, from the chat as well. A lot of it is around and centering around indigenous values and creating community equity for, for black folks and, and communities of color. Um, especially because, of course, due to a lot of the systemic inequities, they haven't been able to, to amass uh, a lot of wealth. Um, how do you see that uh, playing out in the dynamics in, in, in Brussels? And I get the sense that that's also one of the things that the CLT Brussels has really been focusing on. Well, Indeed, well, the idea of giving people the possibility to build up wealth uh, is, is really important to what we do because, um, well, most, not most, but a lot of the people are, are relatively newcomers. They are uh, families who arrived here 20 or 10 years ago um, and who just uh, got some uh, stability, uh, but are still very poor um, and and uh, by giving them the possibility to have decent housing, uh, but on top of that, to, to build some, some wealth and also to be able to do that within a community. Um, um, we think that's really uh, very, very important. And, and that's one of the, the added values of, of what we do compared to um, classical social rental housing indeed. How do you see that uh, creating benefits? How do you see the communities? In what way do they, does it benefit them? And what do you see um, now? How long has been? How long has the CLT been around? The first one now. Maybe that's the first question. Well, it's still very recent, and it's too soon to uh, to prove uh, the the effects. Uh, the first project has been uh, occupied for three years now. Um, but we really and 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 also all this more, more uh, yeah the community di dimension is something we are still developing uh, the way we we try to look for uh, ways of integrating our projects into the into the neighborhoods into the community to open um, some facilities for the for the for the neighbors these are still things we are um, trying to invent, uh, looking for ways of financing it and organizing it and uh, involving people. Um, so too soon to, uh, to, to, to prove, but we, we really believe that uh, uh, our projects will make an impact in neighborhoods, uh, well, such as Molenbeek, which is uh, uh, known in, uh, in uh, big parts of the world for, uh, for very uh, bad reasons. Uh, but I mean, uh, these are neighborhoods where it is important to invest in, uh, in social cohesion. And we think that our projects can contribute to that too. And uh, the most interesting uh, thing about it is that it is the, the residents themselves who will, uh, who will do it. It's not some, uh, some external uh, 
association or, or, or government body. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the residents. And we see that people uh, very often are happy to have this, uh, this possibility to get involved in their communities. That's, that's for me one of the most uh, yeah, interesting things of, of what we do. We, we see that uh, not everyone, most, uh, lots of people are just happy to have their home and that's, that's good also, but some of them really uh, see this as an opportunity to play a role in, in their community. Yes, uh, maybe someone else from, maybe Tom or Callum, if we open up the discussion a little bit, uh, do you have any questions for each other uh, after the presentations? Geert. Or would you like to comment on the issue that we were just talking about, about the how racial and class dynamics are showing up in, in the UK or in Scotland in relation to the CLTs? Or I'd like to pick that point up if it's okay. I think Geert and yeah. Karen, I mean, we see each other enough that we probably have other opportunities to ask <laughs> each other questions. Um, I mean, it's really interesting to, to see the question expressed in the Q&A really well. Um, I mean, it, I, my first thought was actually the last time that England was systematically colonized was maybe a thousand years ago by the French. Um, so we don't really have the same context. Um, probably we you know more like English people going and colonizing other parts of the world. So it, the kind of politics just don't map over from the US to the UK in the same way. Um, there obviously are serious and systematic inequalities um, and issues of racial equity, class, and so on in, in the UK. And those do relate to land, although land is really not seen as a big part of that debate. Um, but housing certainly is. And equal access to housing. And during the pandemic, one of the factors behind the disproportionate numbers of Black and ethnic minority people in the UK dying of COVID-19 is poor housing and overcrowded housing. So there's definitely that context. Um, and there are people, there are CLTs that have been founded in that kind of context, very similar to actually Kurt's example. There are various CLTs in parts of the country where you have very high proportions of people who are born abroad or who are migrant, you know, migrant communities or ethnic minority communities or where that kind of racial dimension is very critical. And sometimes where their motivation for starting a CLT has really been a critique of the way that local government or the market has sidelined them. So there's one in North London where there are proposals to regenerate the whole area that quite transparency will benefit wealthier white residents at the expense of poorer black residents of that area in a historically quite black part of London. And so the CLT there is kind of that's, that's part of what they're trying to address. Um, that said, we're very conscious that there are far too few black led CLTs in England. There are far too few CLTs that really fully embrace the diversity of the population in their area and the struggle sometimes to involve everybody and that community building takes work. So we've, we've had a project for the past couple of years called the Cohesive Communities Fund, named partly inspired by the Sheik project, which we've been involved in through Evergate, to say, well, how can CLTs not take for granted the issues of equity, inclusion, cohesion? How can they really put capacity and time and thought into trying to address that head on? Um, and then the other dimension to it is, and it's kind of it's slightly connected to another question in the Q&A from Bob Love about theoretical frameworks. I mean, I'd love to talk about that for days and I had lots of thoughts following George Monbiot, who I think totally misunderstands Locke's theory of property. But anyway, uh, we're very careful as a national body not to get drawn into things which are basically write us off in the eyes of one political party or another. So we have a conservative government, we have many city and local government authorities run by Labour Party. Uh, there are some Greens, some Liberal, we don't want to paint community land trusts in a way that makes it difficult for, for CLTs in some parts of the country to get support. Those individual CLTs might do that, but we don't. And so this has been a very difficult one for us to approach because the language, particularly at the moment with the current conservative government around this and in responding to things like the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a real danger that we basically turn them, you know, turn them away from CLTs and the way we respond to it. But there's also a danger that in doing that, we then don't address the issue properly. I think that's, I don't know what the answer to that is, but that's, that's been a big dilemma for us as to how we address these issues, how we encourage our members to address these issues and how we respond to the very real inequalities and equity and, and just injustices that the various communities in the UK face. Yeah, so 
Callum, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I just want to briefly comment, uh, comment on that as well. I mean, I, I think fundamentally the 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 issue of of, of these structural inequalities are, are are pretty fundamental to to, to land and, and land role in terms of addressing them is is is, is very central. Um, uh, th there's something there, uh, just a, a kind of passing comment. I've been I've been waxing politically or otherwise around the, the, the kind of policy uh, development around land reform in Scotland and, and how we are off, Scotland is often held up as, you know, being progressive in terms of, of land reform policy, which I think it is. I think it needs to move a lot faster and be more radical actually in terms of what we're doing for, for reasons I've kind of outlined already. But there's an interesting piece of research that the Scottish government published just last week, which was around public attitudes in Scotland to land reform. Um, and, and that very interestingly said that a lot of people don't actually, the general public don't necessarily connect with the, with, with the terminology of land reform. They don't get necessarily what it, what it actually involves. When you explain it to them and when they actually uh, see where the connections are, they're absolutely all for it. And so there's a, a, a big job of work to be done here in Scotland in order to make sure, and the political parties all have a, an important role to play in that, to make sure that people actually do connect the relationship with land and addressing inequality and, and overcoming these kind of structural issues. And yes, there's a, there's, in terms of these inequalities, there's absolutely a kind of a, a, a racial dimension in terms of that, so in, in terms of addressing these, these inequalities there. There's also a gender dimension to it as well. So I think these are, these are all important uh, factors with regard to that. And ultimately as well, there's, there's something there is also around uh, market failure, uh, because a lot of the uh, initial community buyouts that I mentioned in the early 1990s here in Scotland, in the Highlands, they basically took place because um, the, the, the folks living in these communities didn't feel they had any other options. They didn't really feel that anybody else was batting for them, really. And so they kind of they thought taking ownership of this asset, taking ownership of this land is going to enable us to do, not exclusively, but help us to do the kind of things that we want in terms of affordable housing, in terms of security of tenure, in terms of having jobs that are actually uh, reasonably well paid and can help us to stay here and have a decent quality of life. None of that's gone away. Uh, and so land is, is really important and land reform is really important in terms of connecting all of these different elements up to a, a greater or lesser extent. But there's certainly here in Scotland, and I suspect elsewhere, a big job of work to be done to, to keep that momentum going. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a lot of work to be done, um, I, I, I'm sure, all over the world. Um, one of the things that we were talking about uh, in, in our prep uh, when we got together earlier this week uh, was also the conflicting claims on, on land um, as we move towards uh, renewables, um, rewilding, uh, intensive versus extensive agriculture. And uh, we also spoke of the role of community ownership in, in, in working with these, and also in an urban area, uh, when we talk about public spaces and, and green spaces and, 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 and creating affordable housing. Um, maybe we can talk a bit more about that, uh, here. Maybe, first of all, how do you see that playing out in the urban context? Well, we work in we work in a context in a city where uh, where there is n almost no uh, space left to build new homes, uh, and there is an increasing demand for homes. Uh, so that's already uh, some uh, a diff a difficulty. There's a conflict there, and we feel that um, uh, also with uh, increasing awareness on uh, well climate uh, change, uh, but uh, biodiversity. Uh, and also need for public space uh, due to, uh, to uh, what we all experienced uh, during the, the COVID crisis. Uh, the the um, resistance uh, from uh, communities to build new homes and that go beyond uh, NIMBY uh, reactions uh, uh, becomes more and more important. Um, which is really, uh, which is really very difficult because we need land to build homes, um, and um, uh, well, there there is a, a conflict between the need for affordable housing and the need for uh, natural space, for instance, in in the city. 
Um, so for us, that uh, motivates us also to, to go um, a little bit further in thinking about how we can build on a sustainable way. Um, uh, and well, trying to, uh, to, uh, to, to find the right balance to, between these two, uh, these two objectives. Um, and that, that's also some, a reason why we started to think about um, how uh, we could connect the community land trust model to the, to the, the donut econ economy, for instance, because we think that um, um, this, this long-term vision of, of CLTs, this vision of stewardship of land, is, is, is really um, um, very interesting to combine uh, uh, with thinking of uh, circular economy, for instance, because we, we, it, it, it's not enough to, to find new ways of, uh, um, new ways of new building techniques, for instance. We also have to, uh, to find new, uh, new model, models of tenure. And, and we think that combining this um, these two models could really uh, be interesting and could be also uh, an interesting uh, narrative uh, to, uh, to uh, defend the, the, the CLT model as a, as a new way of developing the city. Yeah, so Kate Raworth's Donut, of course, focuses on both the social as well as ecological uh, and how do we stay within the planetary boundaries and also above the social threshold. So I, I, I imagine that um, also in the rural areas and especially looking at, at farming, uh, this and and conflicting claims. Um, maybe Callum, do you um, you know we spoke about this before a bit more about the uh, the situation in Scotland? Yeah, well, well, the, the situation in Scotland, as I suspect, every. every, every everywhere else or in many other places is around how we actually uh, achieve a, a just transition to a net zero carbon economy. Um, and we, as I mentioned in my presentation, we're going to be publishing a report next week um, on the role of community landowners in addressing the climate emergency. And one of the things that, without, without having any spoilers, uh, is, is that a, clearly community landowners certainly in terms of the research that we've had undertaken, have a very distinctive role to play in that just transition. And part of that is, is down to the fact that they are structured in such a way as to deliver for the communities that they serve ultimately. So the, the types of initiatives that they're undertaking uh, are, are meant to deliver in that regard. There's a structural issue, again, here in Scotland in, in terms of the monopoly land ownership and the large scale monopoly ownership of land. Uh, rural land in particular, because a lot of the um, public payments around um, land ownership and land use in particular are, are very much focused now around uh, delivering public benefits and, and, and uh, agri-environmental dimensions to that. Uh, the key question there is who benefits from that? So are, is there a community benefit in relation to uh, the, the types of initiatives that are being undertaken, whether they're rewilding that go beyond the, the, the public benefits. And if, if not, how do we actually ensure that those community benefits are, are, are brought into play? That's a really important kind of connection there. There's also a tension, certainly here in Scotland, uh, within a rural context around ideas of um, what is sustainable and particularly around um, ideas of, of wild land and wilderness, which are very loaded concepts, frankly, certainly here in, in, in Scotland and certainly in, in rural Scotland, uh, and what they actually mean, because the implication is that they mean um, that, that these are untouched uh, areas of land by untouched by human hands for millennia. Well, you know, go back 200 years to things like the Highland Clearances and you will see what is being portrayed as wild or wilderness was no such thing. And so there's a tension and a dynamic there around how we get repopulation in some of our rural areas and balance that with very positive um, e ecological and environmental uh, sustainability and conservation issues that actually reinforce and make mutually reinforcing uh, benefits and connections. There are no easy answers to that, but it's a debate that we're having and I think it's becoming more, more mature here in Scotland. Um, Tom, did you want to add to... Um... Oh. I, th I think in terms of lands, 
uh, Callum and colleagues in Scotland are far ahead of anything we've done in England. And I touched in my presentation on a couple of examples where communities are picking this up. I think similar to housing development, um, there's, a, there's a huge need for communities to upskill themselves in this area. And I'm also nervous about overstating the desire of communities to prioritize this. So I've, I've met community land trusts who have prioritized the, the affordability of the home in terms of the sales price or the rental value over certain ecological concerns. And that was you know, their, their priority. And um, there have been examples of re rewilding in the UK done very badly where people have gone and planted trees on blanket bog, for example, and that's an, it's a valuable habitat and you actually end up with more carbon release by putting trees onto it. So there's, there's sort of complexities in this, you know, technicalities that I think we sometimes forget about. Um, so I think, I think communities can be a part of it and we've, we're closely watching and looking forward to the report that Community Land Scotland is publishing next week on this, so, you know, what, what they're learning in Scotland. And I think trying to advocate for our members to be taking this, making this a high priority and kind of playing their part in addressing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a fundamental issue. And there's also one where certainly when it comes to climate, car carbon emissions, you know, you, it's about budgets and numbers and you can point out where you, you, you've no option but to reach a certain standard. And I think there's a danger we routinely fail that and, and a bit a bit complacent about it because we just talk in terms of nice stories of nice things that are happening. So that's my slightly downbeat uh, co comment on on it. But I, th I think there's definitely potential. There's you know there's huge things, that, huge ways that communities can be part of this agenda. Yes, uh, and also one of the things that we're seeing is a lot of um, having. Uh, oh, uh, that there's also um, a lot of the um, uh, energy corp or cooperatives and I imagine that there's also a lot of links possible to community land trust and also creating um, energy the profits of the cooperatives going back into the community land trust um, and have you seen examples of that Callum maybe that Absolutely. The, the, um, I mean, that's, there are many examples in Scotland of community uh, land trusts which have developed renewable energy, whether it's whether it's wind, hydro, or, or solar, uh, whereby they've, they've invested in, in, in the technology, they've invested in the infrastructure, um, and, and they are and they are paying or they're feeding back the, the, the profit into the community and investing it in the community in, in, in relation to what they're doing. And, and that has multiple benefits. So one example of that, Golson Estate, which is a large estate in the Isle of Lewis in the, in the Outer Hebrides, have turbines. Uh, they have been able to invest some of the funding to address fuel poverty issues there. Um, or, so there's a kind of circular dimension to all of that. The bigger issue here is around um, sort of community wealth building and retaining that wealth, however so defined, in the areas and the communities themselves, rather than having it leach out or being extracted by external players, which is, is what happens to a large extent um, in, in, in some instances in Scotland. You know, when you get um, the, the, the private land market, the estates market in Scotland being portrayed as um, basically a kind of what, operating in its own bubble where, where buyers are, are, are looking at uh, land as a luxury purchase, like a, a Lamborghini or a super yacht. Well, you know, for the communities that buy land and, and the community trusts that do that, they're not doing that as a luxury purchase. They're doing it, that to uh, guarantee their own sustainability. They're two quite different things. And I think that needs to be borne in mind in terms of the, the policy frames for this. Yeah, thanks. We've only got another five, unfortunately, only another five minutes left. And one of the things that the Schumacher Center has been focusing on also in the US is land gifting. Um, seeing as that we're going from a, from a large uh, generational turnover uh, from the previous generation that is, of course, owns uh, a lot of the land. Uh, in the next 10 years, we imagine that there will be uh, a lot of land changing hands. Um, I, I know that Geert has had the experience uh, of, of land being gifted into the CLT by private uh, individuals. Could you just quickly mention or quickly tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, um, well, to start, I, I think uh, well, we always stress also that um, as housing is a human right, uh, we think that uh, the, the authorities also have an obligation to, uh, to provide land and homes uh, affordable 
for uh, for the lowest income. So that's that's something that's very important for us. But then um, I think indeed that uh, blend gifts could be something complementary anyway in our context uh, to uh, to government support uh, for 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 our, our work. And uh, indeed, we, we recently uh, received um, uh, one home, uh, some some of our uh, um, yeah, one of our members who 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 gave us uh, a building with uh, with uh, several apartments and uh, and a working room working space, and also we uh, there was a, a family also recently who uh, who um, uh, how do you call it who um, in Nederland yeah uh, legeerde <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh, well, we we will uh, we will be able to uh, in, inherit their their home uh, once they're they're gone. There. Yeah. yeah. So and 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 uh, indeed uh, that's the I that's that's an interesting way I think of uh, of uh, of developing uh, housing because there are th these two families they they wanted to uh, that. The, the homes they 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 owned would have a a, um, a good use uh, after for forever in fact instead of uh, giving it to some some foundation who would sell it uh, and then do something else with it the yeah. fact of knowing that this home will be used uh, uh, by a uh, by family who needs it and and that uh, this will permanently be available for those in need uh, is something that uh, um, motivated these these two families to to think of us. Thank you. I was just um, as we only have a few one more minute left. I, I just quickly wanted to hear any closing statements that uh, that you have. Maybe maybe some closing remarks here. Or do you have? Uh... Oh, well, uh, uh, I would like uh, to use the opportunity to announce our uh, our international CLT festival that will be uh, that will be launched uh, in a few months. So if you uh, if you have a look on the on the website of the Center for CLT Innovation, you uh, or on the on the Chic website, you will uh, receive all the the information. The idea is to to build some, to build an international CLT movement, and to uh, organize some online uh, activities, uh, uh, workshops like like these, but also film, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I invite everyone to uh, to to participate in this. Maybe we can also share that, um, or either. Do you want to share it in the chat for, for in the uh, Q and A? The uh... well, we don't have any material uh, of it already, so uh, it will be launched uh, in the coming weeks. Callum, uh, have you got maybe some closing remarks? Just to see how much I really enjoyed the the, the discussion and the, the Q and A, and and to hear from 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 Tom and from here to, with regard to what's happening. Obviously, if Tom much closer to home for 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 us, but um, but also here as well in terms of the inspiring stuff that's going on in, in, in Brussels. I think it's tremendous, tremendously exciting work that's going on there. And just to to say, you know, I'd love to keep in touch. And if anybody wants to follow up in terms of of uh, in terms of the participants and the audience, any any questions or issues very happy to, to follow up on on any of that and and if you are free on the 24th of march at uh, 1500 gmt do join us for a free webinar when we're launching our uh, community landowners and the climate emergency report oh, wonderful thanks tom uh thank you very much for joining okay. us thank you, you have remarks or final um uh, Just a bit. Announcement? yeah a couple of a couple of closing thoughts and um, looking at all the interesting questions in the Q&A and thinking about our discussion. Um, one is lots of people asking questions about their views of what CLTs could do or should do. And I think they're really interesting. But for me, one of the key things is it's up to the CLTs themselves to decide what's right for their community. So if a community decides low rent housing is right and they can, what I love about CLTs is in England, normally 
you know, some policy mandarin in, in Whitehall in London, some policymaker decides what's right. This should be what's affordable. And every community in England has to suddenly comply with this new definition. CLTs turn all of this on its head and say, it's up to people in Middlesbrough or Bristol or Dorset to decide what mean, what does affordability mean to their community and how can that be secured in perpetuity? The other is this thing about how much we overlay ideology on what we're doing, which is really interesting. And, you know, I got into green um, economics because I read Small is Beautiful. I'm a big fan of Schumacher, of Ostrom, of Bokchin, all these people. But to me, it's like my past involvement with the free software movement or other kind of commons movements. How can create, we create a commons movement here that can exist within the mainstream market? It isn't seen as a threat by either the Labour Party, the socialist, the left, the right. Nobody sees it as a major threat and people can find in it something that matches their ideology. And all the while we're kind of quietly building or rebuilding a commons. You know, you, most of England used to be held in common. Now it's, now it's almost entirely disappeared. We're just gradually rebuilding it back again. And I think that's a really exciting political project and a really fascinating intellectual project to try to do and to bring people from really diverse perspectives around this idea that put things back in common, let the community decide for themselves. And like Callum, really interesting discussion. You know, thank you to the Schumacher Centre for hosting this and look forward to future collaboration. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. And I totally agree with what you just said, Tom, about the commons. We can quietly build them aside, for, aside from politics. We don't have to wait for elections. We don't have to wait for, for policy. We can, as, as you can see, we can, we can do that. Uh, local organizations, we can help local organizations to organize themselves. So I, I think that it's definitely and I'm convinced that this is the uh, that this is the future. So it's really great to see all of you here and what your the wonderful things that you've been doing in, in, in the countries. And I also very much look forward to working with all of you more and also to hear more about your work. So um, thank you so much for joining us and for your time. And uh, sorry to everyone who joined, who, who asked a question and we weren't able to answer it, but uh, hopefully uh, maybe in the next meeting or maybe you can also uh, contact uh, one of the uh, free speakers. So thank you all. Thank you all for joining us and um, till the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks.